Yes. Yes, I can see that we are live and I'm back again <laughs> with another special guest, very, very special guest I'll be introducing shortly. So uh, welcoming all of you to Surfaces Reporters eTalk in association with School of Architecture, Noida International University. As you know, my name is Vertika Divedi and I'm the founder and editor in chief of Surfaces Reporter. 2020 marks the 10th year of Surfaces Reporter magazine. And as usual, we are on job to uh, empower and power your ideas and creativity and with knowledge that keeps you informed about architecture, interior design and building materials. Today, Surfaces Reporter is celebrating the Kabushia Day and it's a great pleasure for us to have the presence of architect Thomas Werner and special dignitaries, architect Vijay Garg and architect Balveer Verma. So, you know, before I introduce our keynote speaker and our dignitaries, I would request architect Rajinder Kumar, director, School of Architecture, Noida International University, to share a few words with our audience. Thank you so much, Vartika. It's, uh, it, it's always wonderful to collaborate with you for a number of initiatives. Um, thank you so much for being always a good support. Thank you to your team also, also always, always very enthusiastic for anything related to architecture in India. Uh, talking about today's session, we, we have uh, the, the representative of World Architecture, I mean, the Association of UIA, the President Thomas Wani. I remember we were discussing with Thomas like a uh, two months back about, you know, doing uh, some very interesting session where the whole world can all can come and see. Uh, Thomas had been a very active in the domain of architecture profession, not only in, in the Western part of the world, but even in the Asian also, we, he had been a, a part of a number of initiative which, um, which, are, which are bringing architecture profession on, on map because, you know, we, uh, many, many a time uh, our citizens, we don't really understand the importance of architecture profession for our cities. And it's a very high time when today is when the whole world is facing the crisis of COVID pandemic. So it's a time for we as an architect to understand that what where we went wrong or where we can go right in the future. So with this in the mind, uh, I mean, this whole world is celebrating a world architecture week in this week. Yesterday, we have witnessed a wonderful session with the very, very important architect from all over the world. And today we have a Tom, we have Thomas who is going to discuss about his reflection about the La Corbusier and he's also a practicing architect. So he's always inspired with the, with the Corbusier type of architecture. I mean, India is of course, is blessed to have a Chandigarh. And here we can see that we have a two people who are from Chandigarh, I mean, alma mater, myself, Mr. And Mr. Balbi Verma, we, we both come from Chandigarh, the city of Corbusier. So it's a it's a very good day for today to talk about La Corbusier Day, and and who better than Thomas who will who will talk about it. So I will request Vartika if we can formally start the session, and we will have a Thomas presentation followed by a panel discussion, and I will also request the live audience also to be very engaging and share some questions. We will definitely take your questions in the end. And um, I really wish uh, surface on your team for successful event now. Thank you. Come. Thank you, architect Rajendra. It's a great privilege for me to introduce a person like architect Thomas Spinner. He is the current president of International Union of Architects and former president American Institute of Architects, based in Paris and Washington DC. Thomas practice serves public and private clients with global industrial operations. He also works with municipalities to improve urban security. As a board certified security professional, Thomas led groundbreaking research for US embassies and consulates, resulting in landmark recommendations to the Secretary of the State and a new generation of design criteria. He was an international advisor to the Federal Triangle Planning Project, which received a Presidential Design Award. With a group of young architects in Washington, D.C., Vernier pioneered work in energy conscious design and the use of solar and wind energy. 
he was the part of the team that received a PA Design Award for the College of the Atlantic in Bar Harbor. He received the Henry Adams Award for research on public museums completed under a fellowship from the National Science Foundation. An award-winning author on both architecture and security, Thomas was the European correspondent for the Progressive Architecture magazine, where his work was nominated for the Jesse and Neil Award. So that's about our keynote, <laughs> keynote presenter today. And I welcome uh, Thomas very warmly from all the sides of our panelists, uh, myself, and of course, uh, no, uh, School of Architecture, Noida International University. So over to you, Thomas. Vertica, thank you so much and Regenda for these uh, warm welcome and very uh, kind introduction. I am honored and pleased to be with you today and in the company of architect Verma and architect Garg on the panel. Uh, and I'm honored to be part of this occasion for you. Um, I'm going to ask now to share the screen uh, and I ask you please to uh, let me know if it is working correctly. Yes, it is. Very good. Uh, it, it is a, a wonderful day to, to reflect on a number of things and uh, honoring Le Corbusier makes a great deal of sense for us as architects. I've tried to think about the context in which he grew up more than 100 years ago. He was raised, as I'm sure you know, in a relatively small village in Switzerland. Uh, this is a train station in Chaux-le-Fond where he grew up. And he grew up at a time when uh, many buildings looked like this uh, in Europe. And he was surrounded by buildings that had this character, which really was uh, part of a medieval tradition uh, and, and very much uh, what I would describe as ornate European uh, sort of technology and design sensibilities. But he also grew up in the wake of what for the time was the most devastating war human beings had ever known. The First World War from 1914 to 1918, which took uh, a terrible toll in human lives, including many people from India who fought on the side of Great Britain at the time. And there was a tremendous movement, um, including a movement in language. This is the Esperanto alphabet. It was developed in the the late 19th century in 1880 or so, but it had a huge resurgence of interest among intellectuals and political leadership after the First World War as a way of creating a universal language that would help to eliminate some of the barriers to communication and some of the cultural barriers that existed between peoples as a reaction to the, the terrible devastation of the war. And that movement also took expression in the modernist movement um, of which Le Corbusier was of course one of the leading proponents. And so this movement sought to find universal truths in architecture, universal principles of architecture that could cut across cultural boundaries and ethnic boundaries and could elevate uh, the standard of living for all people. Um, and of course, we have come to know it as a movement that sought to eliminate ornamentation and sought to simplify forms and to give form and expression that would uh, cut across these boundaries. Many of these ideas uh, about a new language for architecture, a new promise for architecture, became part of SIAM, the Congress uh, of International Congress about Architecture and Modern Architecture, uh, which Le Corbusier led. He wasn't the only one, but he was a leading, leading proponent. And this is one of the first times uh, in, in architecture that um, there was a great movement to, among people from many countries to, to try and work together to develop a new language and a new approach to design, uh, much of it embodied in this sort of model village produced in, in 1927. I, I hope you can see this image correctly uh, on your screens. Yes. Good. Yes. Um, 
Of course, his legacy is, is familiar to architects all over the world and has become uh, something that we live with still today. And I think as Vertica said at the beginning, it is true that many of us uh, who were educated, let's say some years ago now, um, were certainly grounded in the principles that Le Corbusier and modernism uh, exposed to us. And uh, this is what we see today. He's a revered figure. Um, there was a wonderful exhibition about his life and his work uh, in Paris some years ago. In the end, he didn't produce a great deal of work. It's very interesting that um, perhaps he has uh, 30 or so uh, monumental buildings that are still uh, visited today, Chandigar being principal among them and, and widely respected. But his ideas and his um, approaches and his principles are still very much of the vocabulary we all use and, and we admire. What I want to say about him and his legacy is that he and the people surrounding him in the 1920s became, I think, the first uh, in, in certainly modern times to put forward this idea that architecture and design can actually improve society and improve the human condition and make a difference. And, you have architects from India who carry that idea forward in a way that uh, has never been equaled, in my opinion. And I'll, I'll come back to that. Now, in today's world, um, we face a number of challenges. Uh, this is a photograph from Florida, a place that um, almost never, ever knew cold weather. That's in the southern part of the United States a place that people think of as being warm and sunny uh, all the time. And then in the Midwest, we have seen storms on a scale uh, unparalleled really in modern times and never before recorded. And all over the world, this is a photograph from Greece uh, two summers ago when they had fires on a scale that had never been seen before, uh, driving people literally into the water to escape the fires. and all over the planet and certainly in many parts of India and on the Indian subcontinent, we are seeing flooding and the encroachment of water on human settlements uh, at a scale that is, is very, very difficult uh, to comprehend. This is just an ordinary part of Texas, but uh, you see what happens when the rains come. Now, uh, people are literally cut off from the places where they live uh, to the places where they shop and work and go to school and carry out the daily activities of life. So the first challenge we face, I think, globally is the fact that we see extreme weather almost everywhere on the planet uh, at, a, at a scale and with an intensity that is um, unprecedented uh, in modern times. And that presents uh, both opportunities and challenges for architects. We, we hear a great deal about trying to overcome the patterns of development that have led to, uh, let's say, conditions that exacerbate stream, extreme weather or cause climate change. But we also have to remember that one of the roles we will have, and in fact, we have now as architects, is to help people, our clients and, and humans everywhere, to cope with the effects of changing climate, to grapple with and, and to fight them. I take the example uh, from, from uh, last summer of uh, what happened in Europe. Um, we had temperatures in Paris that had never been seen before. And that is a city, it was 108 degrees Fahrenheit, um, over, in fact, over 40 degrees centigrade in Paris. Um, temperatures that had never been seen before that, for which the buildings and the communities are absolutely unprepared. And so one of the, uh, consequences of this is that we are starting now to look at the surfaces of streets, the surfaces of buildings, their reflective qualities, and how we can design physical environments better to accommodate the fact that we are having more sunlight and higher temperatures for more parts of the year than ever before. I, I cite this example because it's the place I know best. I am sure that if um, you looked at the Indian subcontinent, you would also see patterns uh, that are changing. 
This has consequences, of course, for sea levels. And we see on the eastern seaboard of the United States, settlements in places that had been comfortable and easily accessible for more than a century, and in some cases for more than 300 years, now becoming inundated and uh, probably never to return to productive use for humans uh, in our lifetimes. They're simply being uh, drowned by water. And as I've said before, communities all over the world, in this case, the United Kingdom and canals are overflowing. We're, we're seeing everywhere the consequences of this weather. And it's not an exaggeration to look at images like this. Um, when Hurricane Sandy came up the eastern seaboard, lower Manhattan was flooded to a point that had never been seen before. So that's extreme weather as one of our challenges. Another challenge facing our planet today, of course, is very familiar to people in India, and that is the way we live and the congestion and the consequences of the fact that uh, we are an urban planet now. And because of that, at least a billion people, uh, if we have seven and one half billion on our planet, at least one billion and perhaps many, many more live in places that they build for themselves uh, from materials that they scavenge or scrounge on land that they occupy uh, without legal uh, authority. Uh, and um, many of our communities across the globe, uh, this, this happens to be in the Southern uh, hemisphere of the Americas, but it could be almost anywhere, uh, now have this sort of character of dichotomy, um, places that are built helter-skelter by informal means uh, adjacent to very wealthy and modern places. So our cities take on this uh, dual character uh, where we have squalor next to opulence, opportunity next to exclusion, ignorance next to education, wealth next to poverty. And physically, uh, take the case of Nairobi, uh, our cities take on this, the physical manifestation of this dichotomy. This is the largest slum in Africa, um, probably the largest slum in the world, at least a million people, perhaps as many as two and a half million people uh, living on squatted land in uh, the center of Nairobi. Uh, but it doesn't have to be Nairobi only, it could be many, many cities across our planet where uh, these dichotomies and these injustices and these inequalities uh, exist. So that's the second challenge. That is the enormous need uh, for shelter and for decent accommodations. And now, of course, as uh, you have already mentioned, uh, we are facing uh, a new challenge that has to do with the, the spread of disease and uh, uh, the difficulties we all face now in grappling with a pandemic for which there is no cure and, and very little treatment. So I think it's fair to say that we all live in a world of need. And that is in fact, uh, the condition that faced our planet when the UIA was established 72 years ago uh, in, in 1948. Um, and the principles that guided uh, that formation uh, ironically, we were founded in Switzerland, uh, same place that Le, Le Corbusier came from. Uh, and now I think perhaps there are as many as 3.2 million architects across the globe. And, and the UIA is the only international organization that represents those architects. It was born in the same way that Le Corbusier was born in an era that followed uh, terrible destruction from World War II. Uh, European cities were absolutely in ruins, um, as were many cities in East Asia and, and really uh, throughout the world. And uh, the people who founded UIA gravitated to this man, Auguste Perret, uh, who is remembered principally for his pioneering work with reinforced concrete, uh, which was very influential um, in, in modern architecture. But he was also a person who led the efforts to restore and to rebuild 
European cities and particularly Le Havre uh, in, in the very uh, westernmost part of France, which had been leveled by bombing in World War II, literally flattened um, by the Allies uh, to prevent the Germans from uh, maintaining a stronghold uh, on that part of the Atlantic Ocean. And he uh, and uh, his associates and his brother uh, were instrumental in rebuilding that city and creating a vision for it uh, along the lines of his, his great design principles and reinforced concrete. Some of you may remember, uh, Balbir, you may remember that the UIA was in, uh, had its offices in Auguste Perret's apartment uh, in Paris in the 16th arrondissement. Uh, for many, many years. I think we were there for 19 years until um, his descendants uh, passed away and uh, the property changed hands and we were uh, required to find new quarters. Um, but knowing his work and knowing his influence, there is really probably no better architect to have been the first president of the UIA than Auguste Perret because of his wonderful devotion to the idea that architecture could make an important difference in the world. Today, uh, we're not in such elegant quarters. We're on the 47th floor of the Tour Montparnasse. It's the tallest building in Paris. Some people say it is the ugliest building in Paris. Um, but when you're inside of it, it's a wonderful place to be because it has views of the city that you cannot have anywhere else. Um, the principles and the purposes of the union are unchanged from uh, the date 72 years ago when it was formed. Our first purpose, of course, is to unify architects across the planet. Uh, I hope that today is an example of that. Um, I am so honored to be uh, part of the Indian Institute of Architects program. You are uh, among the most populous countries in the world, the most industrious um, countries in the world, and such an important part of today, our planet's condition today, the promise of our planet in the future. And I have no doubt that India will continue to be one of the most important uh, countries on earth in terms of setting examples and um, forging the way. A second purpose for the, uh, for the uh, union, of course, is to influence policies that affect the built environment. And that's what we've worked so hard to, to do in the last years, uh, to try and have a voice to political leadership, to governments, to the people in general about the importance of design and the value of design and the value of architecture in shaping the way we live. And I will come back to that. And of course, our purpose is through architecture to advance society and the human condition. So if you think of UIA as these three initials, UIA, um, that, that is really the purpose of the organization. And we are devoted to the proposition that I began with uh, and that I think Le Corbusier was one of the early proponents for, and that is the idea that architecture and design can improve our condition uh, and the condition of our planet. Um, I try to live by certain principles uh, of design and public design. And here they are, and I, I'm going to talk just a little bit about these uh, as, I, as I come to an end. One of the things that I think is so encouraging about where our profession is today is the fact that Architects almost everywhere, and I, I'm in a position, I think, to say this uh, because I do have contact with architects all across the planet, almost everywhere, and I pick the example of Costa Rica because it was easy and close at hand, architects are speaking of these great issues, these great challenges that uh, face our planet, but they are also uniquely, perhaps, doing something about them. And that's a wonderful thing about our profession is that um, we are in a position actually to do something that affects these very conditions that I've talked about. Um, I don't like to use the word sustainable be, uh, because in the English language, to my ear, to me, uh, it, it means something um, like continuing to do what we now do, uh, which is really not what is required. I think, in fact, 
we're at a critical stage, an urgent condition, an acute condition. And so what design becomes an imperative, it's essential for us to move in a different direction. So much of the difficulty we face in the developed world and, and in parts of the developing world and the emerging great nations is tied to the way we build and the patterns of development that we have seen emerge in the last 50 years. Um, and that is essentially very automobile dependent. It is um, patterns of development that encroach on valuable agricultural land, on natural land, and there's a sort of endless expansion, certainly in North America, but in fact, just about everywhere um, where there is wealth, this pattern of development that um, ignores the past, paves over a natural territory and reinforces a, a dependent on the automobile. I don't know if you can read this. It's a very interesting figure uh, about uh, automobiles in Europe. Uh, automobile typically in Europe is parked almost 100% of the time. It's only uh, driving about 8% of the time. The time it's driving, about 25% of that is looking for a place to park. Uh, most automobiles in Europe carry at least five people. Uh, but in fact, when they're driving, there's on average 1.5 occupants, many single automobiles. Uh, in an internal combustion engine, a car that is powered by a gasoline or a diesel engine, uh, there's at least 14% loss in the potential energy. Um, and so only a fraction of it reaches the wheels. And most of that energy is used to move the car, not, not the people in it. So it's a terribly inefficient machine. Um, it is not what you would come up with if you were setting out to design the best way to move people in an urban environment, but it is the dominant uh, mode of transport in most cities. Um, the reason then that so many organizations, including our own, have embraced the 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals is because they are as clear an expression, I think, as we have, and certainly as strong a political political agreement as, as we are likely to see about the challenges that must be overcome if we are to reverse some of these inequities and difficulties that, that face our planet. I want to talk just for a moment about uh, the architecture guide that UIA is producing with our friends and, and colleagues in Denmark. Uh, you can simply look up architecture guide to the UN Sustainable Development Goals and you will find it in PDF to download. But this project, which is now just ready to issue, it issued, announced yesterday, the second edition, takes every single one of the sustainable uh, development goals, here taking the example of no poverty, and shows an example of a project, this one uh, in India, that uh, addresses the sustainable development goal and shows how architecture and design uh, provide a response to, uh, for in this instance, the, re the eradication of poverty or the attempts to uh, grapple with the, the problems of poverty. And every single one of those 17, I'm just showing two of them, uh, goal one and goal eight, uh, is addressed in this publication with a project uh, that has been built uh, somewhere in the world, responding to a set of climate conditions uh, and economic factors, cultural and ethnic issues, uh, the a, a response to these. And so it's a very important uh, resource, I think, for people who are interested in working uh, to achieve the goals uh, of the United Nations and UN Habitat for what they call sustainable development, but what I call imperative development. I'm taking a personal interest now in the subject of infrastructure because in the United States, uh, when we have a responsible government, and I hope that will come soon, uh, we are going to have to turn our attention to the condition of our infrastructure. Uh, the United States has too long ignored the condition uh, of, its, of its infrastructure. 
And I define that as the, the basic systems of support for industrial economic activity, of course, but also for uh, human life and the way citizens live. Unfortunately, in our country, when people use the word infrastructure, they think of this. They think of highways, roads, large, large systems, huge investments of money, many many of these systems almost entirely dependent on automobiles and the internal, internal combustion engine. I think it's very important to face the fact that we are going to have in the developed world uh, a very different future in which the automobile will not be as dominant. It's a very difficult um, matter to address uh, politically and economically. This is the uh, riverfront in Paris that uh, in the 1970s, early 1970s, had been uh, paved over and turned over entirely to automobiles. And now, just recently, it's opened a bicycle lane, uh, very difficult to achieve, lots of political strife. Uh, and of course, the famous uh, shared bicycle system in Paris, which is becoming a very um, important element of how people are getting around. The point I make in, in showing these slides is that um, part of the infrastructure we need is infrastructure and equipment and uh, the basic systems that support new modes of transport and make it easier and more attractive for people to use them. Uh, the investments in this bicycle system are significant. Um, it is not a dockless system. The bicycles cannot be abandoned helter-skelter anywhere as you see in China and other parts of the world, they must be returned to a station and that station is computerized and keeps a record of who took the bicycle, how long it was gone, when it was returned and where. It's actually a very sophisticated and frankly, a very expensive system. And that is in fact, what is required in, in modern urban centers if they wish to have people use these systems uh, as, a, as a serious competitor. Uh, that's about the nodes and the equipment. There's a lot to say, I think, about the, the paths and the networks that uh, are used for bicycles. This is an example of a bicycle path tacked onto a uh, bridge for automobiles, uh, simply appended to a redundant structure, a structure that was heavy enough to carry an, another path. There are many, many examples. I expect we will also see uh, new developments in uh, movement systems for people, some of which are being tested now, uh, lightweight, rather flexible, dedicated ways for people to move. There's no shortage of examples of this. But I also want to come back to um, the simple principles of infrastructure that talk about uh, what is available to people who live in cities within proximity. And to me, this, this famous photograph from Paris expresses a lot. It says that a mother can walk with her two children to a park that is not very far away. It's an enclosed environment. It is green, it is protected, and it provides places for people to sit and to play and to be safe and to recreate not very far away from home. And so when we talk about infrastructure, and I, I address this to my colleagues in North America and in Europe, we really must think about the very simple and basic things that make life pleasant uh, and, and easier for people of all ages and all levels of income. I, I don't know how relevant this is in the Indian context, but surely uh, you are thinking about how investments in public infrastructure can help the most people uh, in the most places. And I would encourage you not to forget parks and the very simple inexpensive, inexpensive modes of transport and recreation. That includes uh, public markets. It includes uh, ways in which people can have informal gatherings very simply. We see examples all over the world. This is a diagram uh, that comes from uh, South America about uh, efforts that are being made to transform streets. Here's an old typical street with cars parked on it uh, in front of a school. And what can be done to change the character of that street and introduce new infrastructure that will make it a safer and more pleasant place for children 
uh, who attend the school and for their parents who come to get them. So we see examples of this everywhere developing in the world and architects have this wonderful ability to create visions of how things could be different and to communicate that vision to people who do not have that gift or that ability. And that is a, that is a powerful tool, uh, I think, that we as architects can use. I, I want to close just by saying that, um, you know, there are figures from India in architecture who are revered and widely known. Uh, I picked two of them because uh, in my education and lifetime, I've had some reason to come to know them and their work. And I cannot think of a place <clears throat> on the planet, I cannot think of a country in the world that has better opportunity to address the issues and the challenges facing us in the 20th, uh, 21st century than India and its architects. And so I hope that by being part of your program today and by being given the privilege of making these remarks, I can ask you to do all you can to take the world stage and to show your best work and to show how India and its architects are addressing the problems that we all face and that India itself faces because you have done that in the past um, and you have been a very strong force for good in the UIA and in our profession and I fervently hope that will continue uh, for a long time to come. Thank you very much. Those are the remarks I, I wanted to make at the outset. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing the screen now and uh, I look forward to a panel discussion with all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thomas. Thank you so much. May I request hey. uh, architect Rajendra Kumar to please uh, uh, you know, continue the discussion with your set of questions? Well, I, I I don't know if you will be moderating or I should be moderating. Uh, uh, you have but, certain questions for Thomas, isn't it? I do have, but before that, I, you know, I just want to comment one thing about my recent experiences when I traveled to Boston last year. I, I visited Carpenter Center. Uh, and in Carpenter Center, I, it was so pleased to see, it was written at the entrance only that this is the only building of Parvozier in United States of America. Please respect it. So <laughs> I believe, and that was very touching because you know when when you see a great nation like United States of America giving a such a great respect to um, uh, a building of uh, Parvozier, the Carpenter Center, it was so pleasing. Of course, I mean I was so touched. And uh, today is the birthday of Parvozier, so it's a I believe that there's nobody denies the, the fact that Corbusier was the great and he deserved that much of respect. Be it in Chandigarh, we recently got uh, three building of uh, Corbusier's building in Chandigarh as a World Heritage Monument. So I, I'm, I'm really very pleased. I'm, I'm very touched that uh, Thomas is very, um, he's, in his speech, he's talking very practical aspect of today's time also. At the same time, it's also very much not forgetting the fact about the importance of a masters like Corbusier. Uh, uh, and it's good that you raised the point about Sian because I have been uh, in my uh, course, I have been really talking about the organization like a Sian, which is not present in today's time. And I'm very sure that uh, if an organization like Sian's come now, I don't know how the government will react on it. So we will uh, leave these kind of a reflective point uh, for Vartika to start the dialogue. And so I will request Vartika if you can formally yeah, yeah. introduce Mr. Balbir, Mr. Vijay, and then we, we, we take it. I'm also on live, there are a lot, lot of questions on live questions also, we can take questions, please. Yes, so let me take this opportunity to introduce our special dignitaries sitting with us today. Architect Balbir Verma and Architect Vijay Garg. So Architect Balbir Verma is the former president of the Indian Institute of Architects, IIA. He's a graduate of Chandigarh College of Architecture. In addition, he has served as Zonal Chairman Acacia, Chairman of Committees of Professional Practice of both Acacia and Commonwealth Association of Architects. 
member board of Gov governor spa new delhi spa vijayawada 2 presently he is the chair chairman advisory committee of the national information center of earthquake engineering iit kanpur welcome architect balbir verma thank you and next is with us <laughs> uh, none of them actually need introduction yet i'm giving you a piece of introduction for architect vijay garg as well architect vijay garg is an architect with more than three decades experience in architectural practice he's an alumnus of the prestigious school of planning and architecture delhi he's a member of council of architecture nominated by government of delhi he was acting president council of architecture he was alternate Council member of UIA, Honorary Treasurer of IIA. He has also been a part of various committees of Government of India and various state governments. Welcome, Architect Vijay Garg. So, uh, carrying forward this discussion um, with this eminent panelist, it's a privilege for me to discuss about, you know, um, the Corbusier Day and talking about how. Together, all of us can make the cities better. So since architect Rajendra was talking about Siam, so let me start with a question regarding that. So as we all know that Siam is the International Congress for Modern Architecture. It was an organization founded in, 20, uh, in 1928, but unfortunately it was disbanded in 1959. It was started by a group of 28 European architects organized by Le Corbusier, and uh, uh, 27 more architects. So Siam uh, was one of many 20th century manifestos meant to advance the cause of architecture for social art, for uplifting how, the way that we live. The organization was hugely influential. It was not only engaged in formalizing the architectural principles of the modern movement, but also saw architecture as an economic and political tool, the way that Thomas Boyner already uh, explained and expressed in his presentation, that could be used to improve the world through the design of buildings and through urban planning. So my first question to the eminent set of panelists here is, do you think such kind of initiative uh, is possible to be formed today? It, uh, should such a... Uh, you know, initiative be formed today in today's context, and how will that be possible? So, uh, I would like to start with uh, architect Balbir Varma. Thank you, Prakita. Before I uh, take up your question, let me thank Thomas for a wonderful presentation and the way he, within this 30 minutes, connected so many things for us, for all architects who are now watching this program and for us also, like his usual way of putting everything in such an intense manner that you really are benefited from the words he speaks and the information he parts with. Thomas, thanks for your confidence in the architects of India. And as you mentioned, yes, whatever I can do to promote the cause of architecture, and I must say mostly for UIA also, we all will be doing it up to the best of our abilities. And I don't think UIA will at any time have a situation saying that Indian counterparts or the Indian architects are not promoting the objectives of UIA. Thanks once again, Thomas. Coming to Vartika's question, yes, Siam was at a time when it was necessary that architects should come together, should have a collective thought that how do they promote architecture, not for the benefit of the architects, but for the benefit of the society and how 
they would be able to make the modern modernism in architecture and promote it further and convince also the government that how to take care of various needs and necessities of the people or the built environment having said that and coming to the question that will that kind of an conference or will that kind of a cohesion is required i think as on today we already at various levels have so organizations of architects at the top is uia every 3 years we have a world congress where it is not only few architects who participate it's thousands of architects along with all the one can say the dignitaries or the well known architects of the world and we always i'm sure thomas will second me decide on policies during that congress which not only helps the country where the congress is being held but the world as a whole so i think uia as on today at the international level then arcasia at the asian level commonwealth association of architects at the commonwealth countries level and every individual in national institute in their country level are in a way working towards what cm started we should thank abuzir and those people who brought in this idea that this should happen in this organization uia i think is doing along with all the 103 countries who or maybe more who are participating whose professional institutes are participants in this are working for the same cause and i wish all the best to the architects in their endeavors to do whatever best they can do and specifically we would not need organizations which are at in jilistic level but at the international or national level which is already happening that's what i thought i should say when you talk something about sam thank you thank you so much architect balveer verma architect vijay garg uh, your points on the same please thank you vartika for the opportunity i'm very honored to be here along with architect balveer verma and president thomas and uh, thank you uh, president thomas uh, it has been very enlightening presentation and i uh, am really impressed the way uh, our president of the world community has explained what architects stands for and what uia stands for that like you defined uia is definitely very attractive and is a very good packaging i hear say that we must uh, um, brought bring forward uh, to the pp uh, 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 in general and so that people know what architects can do and i think we need to make it more little more simple uh, the way you have made it very simple for us to understand we need to make the life people simple for people by design and uh, their uh, our work and coming to the question uh, of vartika syam i endorse the views of architect balveer verma that in today's time we have so many organization other than uh, 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 see the kind of work uia is doing and uh, uh, all other organization even if you talk about uh, even at every city level today we have organizations of the architects who are doing work for that city uh, if we take about even uh, city like delhi we have group of architects who are working and raising their voice about various uh, trends and changes to be brought in city uh, for the benefit of people and uh, 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 making city better so i think uh, that kind of organization is not required it is only what is required is that we need to strengthen our people and to channelize their thoughts because now we have too many organization the problem today is we have too many organization and channelization of thoughts 
is required and, and we need to actually urge it to the governments that a lot of the governments understand what architects viewpoint is but uh, it is somewhere lost i guess uh, that we are pleading for ourselves or pleading for pp uh, i think uh, what we need to convey as architecture community that we are for the people and whatever we are working is only pleading for the people that if you are talking talking of good city or talking for bringing in some changes in the city it is for betterment of people's life and what we stand for it also making people's life happy and sustainable and you very rightly said sustainable is like stagnant everything is uh, sustainable and whatever we have and i think we need to do it little more uh, in a better and more improvised fashion and little more aggressive and i i'm sure in today's scenario whatever organizations we have and we have good uh, uh, hierarchy of organizations we can take up and uh, build a channel of thoughts uh, for uh, which can bring in good cities good thoughts about uh, like whatever the work carbuzier has uh, done in india has been widely appreciated and celebrated we talk about even after 50 60 years Uh, uh we talk about uh, uh, today almost 67 years sir uh, when chandigarh was inaugurated so uh, 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 today we, even we celebrate uh, whatever is done in uh, chandigarh not only in terms of town planning in terms of architect and in terms of the what, what it made people's life easy and when we go to chandigarh we can't forget about talking about architecture and that is what is the contribution of corbusier and that i think that is where all the, uh, the architects organization have made a difference and that is why uh, organization like siam i think there are a lot of organization already exist like that they need to be only channelizing the thoughts yeah wonderful Mad wonderful <laughs> wonderful edition so uh, my next question is for thomas so i would like to know about your experiences um about india actually about india yes share some of your experiences i think you have visited india already i have uh, uh, regrettably it was only once and uh, <laughs> i was able only to go to lucknow Uh, oh, a fascinating well, experience. A <laughs> yes, a lovely place, a wonderful hospitality, food and culture of course. Uh but I think what impresses me <clears throat> most about India is its diversity, its great size and the wonderful industriousness of the people. I I think this is a a thing to behold. It is a, a revelation to me. and um i am anxious for a time when the world will allow more travel and for us to return to a situation where we can uh visit our our friends and colleagues and experience new places i i do think that india is one of those places in the world where many people build for themselves and um uh, <clears throat> i think it's important for architects to keep in mind that um we can help people to do better for themselves even if uh they build for themselves and i i'm very drawn to the work of of several architects I, i'll take the time to mention them uh alejandro aravena from chile uh has done uh, a project i wish i i should have prepared some slides to talk about this but <laughs> his his uh, project for the chilean copper mine workers Uh, reflects his clear understanding that people are going to build for themselves they're going to use materials that they scavenge or buy very inexpensively they're going to build when they can uh, when they can afford to in time and in money and they're going to build in the manner that they choose uh, and in the end it is not um, the product is not architecture but the product is a better place for people to live and an architect and the the mind of an architect is what created the basic infrastructure the basic framework within which people could build and aravena is very skillful in thinking of this and produced a beautiful project that can be examined uh, by by many students and many professionals in a completely different context in a completely different part of the world uh Francis Carey uh, who is from uh Burkina Faso in in Africa 
has done so much to uh, teach tribal uh, communities how to build much better buildings with indigenous materials, uh, with the things that are at hand. And of course, India has a great tradition in this regard and, and many great architects who have tried to do this. And I think for our profession, um, that is a place to return. And I, I think we have the great ability to show by example. And um, uh, when political figures see something that works and they see something that is in fact uh, successful, they like it, they will grab it. And uh, architects who produce successful projects, who make things that work, have this wonderful power to attract uh, political attention and, and political allegiance. So words count and uh, manifestos count and statements make a difference. But I think what really uh, actually makes a difference in the world is the physical example of what is built and the fact that it makes life better for people. And I, I, uh, you asked me at the uh, outset about my impressions of India. My impressions are that um, if this is a place where those contributions uh, can be made in very important ways and uh, with, a, with a population of architects who are very, very attuned to the challenges and the problems of the 21st century and wonderfully equipped to address them. So, uh, with that... Allow, Vartika, I'm sorry to interrupt. If you yeah, allow sure. me, I mean, there are a number of questions which are coming. So one question, a very important question. Please, raised, please go ahead. Raised by a very important um, architect. So I just wanted to read out and sure. I would also like everyone to comment on it. This yeah. question is by Mrs. Sumit Kaur. She is an ex-chief architect of Chandigarh. I mean, a very respected architects of Indian com Indian architect community and the world. She is uh, uh, asking a question that each city and its has its unique challenges. However, there should not we should we should not put together international best practices which can inspire each other. So that's the question by architect Sumit Kaur, the uh, chief architect of ex chief architect of Chandigarh. This is anyone can take this question. Maybe start with the uh, Balbir, sir. Can you, can you repeat the question? The uh, question is by Ms. Sumit Kaur, the ex yes. of Chandigarh. Each city has its own unique challenges. Should we not put together our best international practices and inspire each other? Sumit, welcome to this webinar. I'm very happy that you are watching this and what you have mentioned as part of the question, the only thing I would say, yes, it should be done. And that is what all these organizations at national or international level during their get togethers or conferences try to do, bring in all the best practices and make use of whatever good things are being done everywhere in the world and you have not only asked this question but i think you have made a statement and i agree entirely with your statement i believe chandigarh is the best example of such thing i mean the best I would not, like you can say chandigarh is and chandigarh is talking about chandigarh the moment you start talking about chandigarh and kabul you know a if I started talking about it, it will take a very long time. But at the same time, what Thomas mentioned in his presentation about how architecture can improve the way of living of the people or the inhabitants or the society. Chandigarh is one of the best example in the world. I haven't seen a person who cleans the roads or who swipes the roads, takes as much pride as anyone else doing any other work other than in Chandigarh. I always find them like 
since i have all of you know i have spent so many years we i studied in chandigarh college of architecture so that means we have experienced chandigarh we have experienced kalbuzia much much more than maybe other people don't have that benefit but when you see they take the, these people who even who they are cleaning the road they take pride in that that they want to keep it clean and they and the the way the because thomas also mentioned about those neighborhood parks that a mother can go with their children without the concept of neighborhood parks if you realize is one of the best concept in chandigarh the way it has been used i am not saying that it has not been done anywhere else but for a modern city which was built for india along with keeping all other indian context in mind that is how this was done and kabuzia and chandigarh had brought architecture in the forefront as far as our country is concerned and it was thomas also mentioned about shri doshi shri doshi shri kanvinde all these people worked with kabuzia before they started their own practice and kabuzia has also st is still being remembered not only for the town planning but also for the buildings and i would say sometimes we say about gandhi ji like this but in this case while we are at an architectural forum i see say that we need to bring back kabuzia to get our get rid of this glassy texture what we are building because all this glass facades whether they are required because of environmental reasons or not for the needs or not are there everywhere and we need car need carbuzia to be brought back to teach us how good buildings can be made without those being glassy texture thank you thank you so much so um architect vijay garg uh, i would like to know from you about your experiences of working with uia you have to unmute yeah yes thank you vartika very pertinent question but uh, <laughs> uh, i worked uh, i attended three of the uia uh, general uh, uh, uia congresses all thanks to architect balbir varma uh, first because he introduced me to uia when i was not even aware what uia is all about and i went with him to first uia congress to istanbul and that congress i still remember as one of the most uh, loved uh, events i ever attended in the terms of architecture communities event and uh, there we it is not only that conference that we celebrated architecture we came Uh, we had so much amount of networking across the globe that we met each and every architect students and that city was celebrating architecture i can't even explain that istanbul congress and uh, i even i attended after that uh, in one in italy one in japan and but uh, that impressions of that istanbul congress i still remember whenever i recall uh, so that was the best experiences and because that there we came into uh, contact with uh, best of the architects in the world and most common people uh, in terms of architecture profession and they are interacting together i have first time at 1000 3000 people uh, attending one uh, webin uh, one conference live and there no space to attend so if if conference starting at 8 i have to be there at 8 if i reach at 8 2 i don't get a seat so uh, uh, that kind of uh, and uh, the kind of learning that happened there in that one congress i think that is more than one years experience in working here in india and i told everyone that uh, whomsoever i meet that it is a world of an experience and whenever one should get an opportunity to visit uia they must go and attend world congress at least once in lifetime and it is definitely gives you a lot of teaching a lot of experience in terms of exchange of thoughts and great ideas meet their great people meet their and a kind of ui kind of service because not only in terms of architecture the creativity 
and the kind of uh, ideas not in terms of city planning town planning or architecture is much beyond and it is a human relationship and and, and i have seen even the students the way students come there interact and even attended that i i happened to attend all the three general assemblies on all the three occasions and meet uh, three presidents and uh, even participate very aggressively in one of the uh, uh, uia congress uh, general assembly so i am sure uh, that uh, that is a world of an experience and uh, it is must for an every every architect in the world at m- once should experience if not more and if we can afford we should go more and more and UIA is one platform where we can actually make the difference and tell the world uh, this is what architecture is about, and uh, that is where uh, the thoughts of the great people meet and very simply convey what we mean and what uh, uh, how we can access. Before that, uh, even we lived in India. The Charles Korea was a big name, and uh, I met Charles Korea for the first time there in that conference. and uh, uh, all that, that i i am giving all credit to veer verma sir for giving us opportunity and exposing to uia and he is the probably the one in the whole country i remember he has taken so many people to uia and now so many people willing to go to uia in that time only he could collect only five six people to go to uia that time and thanks to his and that uh, if today uia congress happens i am sure hundreds of people from india will go and attend and uh, <laughs> celebrate of course of course uh, vertica are... i i hope i hope vertica that you are recording this because yes, of course i want i want to problem. use uh, vj garg as uh, the advertisement for people to come to rio <laughs> <laughs> good can i just add Yes, I would like uh, Architect Balbir Verma and Architect Rajendra Kumar to add, please. I mean, Balbir sir can can uh, yes. I mean, for Thomas, for your information, this is a live. This is going live on Facebook, so it will be recorded. So uh, I'll share the link with you. But um, on a lighter note, uh, Vijay sir, I want to I I want to take you back around fifteen years from now. One of the good um, outcome of your. IIA participation in Italy was also that we met first time. Yes, I Milan. met Rajender Kumar in Italy because of UIA. <laughs> I was in Milan that time. I was living in Milan, and Balbir sir and I believe Kapil Mehta sir, if I am not yes. wrong. Yes, you and Kapil Mehta. Uh, you, uh, you came to Torino, and then you landed in Milan, and then we then you went to Torino. So I believe that was also one of the very uh, one of. as a good delegation about 30 people attended from india yeah but but we we met first time in milan though we o, we both are... and because uh, that that italy remember i remember because of our presidential candidate died that was an unfortunate incident in that congress but yeah. that is how and how that was handled by uia again that was heads off yes yes i remember that time yes, uh, we had our ambassador uh, indian ambassador he also wanted to travel to torino but he couldn't make it but i would like to add one point here you know when when we are talking of uia we also have a one student association there i mean if any student is also i mean live they can also come and we'll take some question about our organization called nasa national association of student of architecture which is a different nasa than uh, than thomas nasa i mean that is uh, that's a different nasa indian nasa is national student national association of student of architecture one of the strongest body of of architecture student we have seen like a thousand of the students always meeting and all so such kind of student bodies are also a very very important factor for determining the the future architect architecture course of of india i believe that uie should also do some kind of collaborate anya i i must add because Uh, i believe that during balbir verma sir's tenure as president he has sponsored students uh, to attend uh, even torino even japan and i had taken two students that time to japan uh, uh, to attend uia congress and that was all uh, selected by iia and iia um, supported them to go and their uh, registration fees was waived off by the uia 
What I think the Durban also in Durban also some of the students from Chandigarh yes, also. That is a regular tradition, I guess. Uh, UAE. Please send your comment, please, sir. Yes, Rajinder. Yes, uh, yes, you mentioned about Italy. Otherwise, I would have mentioned about this. I knew that uh, our interaction with you in Italy. When I talk about my experience with UIA, first of all, I would like to thank IIA, the Indian Institute of Architects, because of which it was possible that I could be part of UIA Council. That was also, we must remember that we had one of the UIA presidents from India, that was Shri J.R. Bhalla, Jayaratan Bhalla, who are unfortunately died a few years back. But it was very strange that it was 22 years after Mr. Bhalla having been the president, I got into UIA as UIA council member. Then I realized the fact that one should let each and every architect in their national countries to know about what UIA is. And that is how they get interested. And whosoever has been part of UIA, either in the committees or in the work program or as council members, have benefited and have made sure that the institute in their own countries get benefited. We have had the opportunity of various UIA presidents visiting India and speaking to various gatherings of architects. I as I just mentioned, I mentioned in the beginning, maybe by that time we had not started, which I was uh, telling Thomas that the first UIA council, which was the 86th UIA council meeting of UIA, was held in Chandigarh. And today we are talking about Kabuzir and Chandigarh. And uh, I'm very happy that that meeting at that time had happened. At that, and after that, in 2001, Vasilis Sugutas, who was the president at that time, we had a conference on housing for poor, which was almost similar to the theme which, on which UIA had a webinar yesterday. And then we have had the benefit of other, of course, Luis has been coming to India very regularly, whether it was for Arcasia and all that. Why I'm mentioning all this? All these people from UIA have benefited the profession by not only participating in the conferences or talking to the architects, but were there available with us when we met various authorities and had brought forward various points of the benefits of the profession, that how the profession can serve the society better. On my personal level, I have spent many years at UIA as an active council member. Then we also hosted UIA PPC, which is the Professional Practice Commission, which according to me is one of the most important commission at UIA, in addition to the Education Commission, when we want to tell architects that how to practice professionally, how to practice your professionally is the aim of the PPC and in today's global movements and all architects working at various levels, the various policies of that practice commission are useful and I'm sure not only at the Indian Institute of Architects but various other countries national associations are trying their best to bring it home to the authorities that they should adopt these policies to provide better services of architecture at international level for the communities altogether. The one more thing which I can add, 
personally, as Vijay was saying, has been a wonderful experience. I should not say has been because it is still an experience. I am still part of UIA, irrespective of the fact whether I am a council member of UIA or not, but I am an architect and the, till the time I uh, am able to be part of the activities of UIA, I will always be there and I look forward to this postponed Congress, which was supposed to be held in Brazil this year, is now has been postponed because of the COVID. And once again, coming back to Vijay's comment, we'll ask as many architects and students as possible, come to Brazil, come with us, you will experience, and then you will not stop going to UIA Congresses. You will always look forward to UIA Congresses. Of course, every architect looks forward to their national Congresses. We like going to IIA's conferences, but going to UIA Congresses is going to be a much wider and bigger experience. Thanks, Swartika. Thank awesome, you. awesome, wonderful, wonderful. So through the word of architect Vijay Garg and our great Valvir Burma, we have sort of, you know, kind of visited the Congress, UIA Congress. So yes, many are saying count them in, in the live discussion. I see, I saw that architect Neelam Manjunath, a very, very renowned architect who works a lot with bamboo. She's saying, count me in for the next meet. <laughs> welcome, like, Manjunath, welcome. <laughs> So uh, this question of mine is now going to Thomas. Okay. So as we have been discussing Please. about, yes, uh, you know, uh, traveling and going and uh, attending this kind of Congress and all this is a very, very crucial for architects to learn. And as uh, architect Vijaygar already said, like it was like one year of learning, you know, <laughs> so that kind of a thing. So what do you think collectively? collectively professional bodies like UIA, IIA, COA can do together to make better cities, better living conditions, better, better societies, better living conditions for our, uh, you know, for our lives and future. Yeah. How just, can we do it collectively? Just about every professional association in the world of architects, I, my own institute, the American Institute of Architects, the Royal Institute of British Architects, the Indian Institute of Architects, the Chinese uh, Architectural Society, every professional society is trying to do something to improve its ability to uh, produce work and to make contributions that are meaningful and have a difference. The beauty of the UIA and, and I'm certainly grateful to Vijay and to Balbir for uh, your very kind words about the Congress. The beauty of the UIA is that it is a place where architects can come together across national boundaries and share their experience and their knowledge. We have a, a current example of that um, having to do with the pandemic and the COVID-19 uh, infections. We, are, uh, we have launched a platform uh, within UIA, a digital platform that is accessible on our website, where uh, architects from all over the world can share their experience about uh, designing uh, hospital environments to accommodate large numbers of people who are ill, uh, about uh, changing the way in which uh, air circulation in buildings is handled to try and combat uh, the virus and, and to protect people from the spread of the virus. So, in times of crisis, and, and I know Balbira is very active in earthquake uh, activity, in times of crisis, architects do come together and try to help one another across national boundaries. And that is really what the UIA is for. I think now, as I said in my talk, the, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals are a very clear expression of what society would like to achieve and how we would like to improve our world so that poverty, ignorance, disease, insecurity, all these difficulties that we face are somehow improved and somehow overcome. And I think the, the contributions that architecture makes to each one of those goals is the right way for us to approach uh, our future, to try and address 
in whatever way we can at a small scale, at a large scale, in whatever way comes to us to try and make improvements uh, in these areas that uh, are so important to the future of our planet. Um, I, we're coming close to the end of this session and uh, I, I think it would be appropriate for me just to express my thanks to Surfaces and uh, to you, Vertica, for uh, having hosted this and, and doing such a nice job. Uh, my thanks to Rajender Kumar and, and the School of Architecture for the invitation to join you. Uh, it's really been a privilege and I am so happy to see Balbir and Vijay. Uh, it seems like too long uh, and yet in some ways it seems like only yesterday, which is a wonderful thing about friendships and about international colleagues across borders. Uh, I am very grateful to the Indian Institute of Architects for this opportunity uh, and especially for its long record of supporting the UIA. It, it's very important. Um, every country comes to a point where its architects say, what is the value of this? Why are we contributing money? Why are we spending our time on this? And I think India is one of the countries that has always said, this is valuable, this is important, this is something we should continue with. And I am so grateful for that. And I know that our colleagues around the world are grateful for that, for the commitment and the sustained leadership uh, that you have shown. Uh, I thank all the participants. I, I wish I could see you. Uh, I know there are quite a number. Um, I hope this has been very interesting for you. It certainly has been my great pleasure to be a part of it. So thank you for that. Uh, thank you so much. Yes, architect Rajendra, it's over to you now. <laughs> no, I mean, still we are not closing. I mean, I am just reading a lot of messages for architect Balbir Verma. Jeet Kumar Gupta talked uh, that we still remember uh, uh, Balbir Verma still remains valuable for his understanding and commitment for um, architecture fraternity of India. Puneet Sethi, the chairman of Indian Institute of Architect Haryana has talked that architect Balbir Verma is one of the best IIA president ever. But so um, there are a lot of appreciation which we are coming. I mean, I would like to also uh, take a uh, note of one of the questions by Neelam. She has mentioned a very important point, which we should also, Neelam Manjunath. Mm -hmm. uh, she talks about that before, uh, we, we talked about Ala, uh, Aravena, Alessandro Aravena, uh, the Chile housing before, but before that, uh, for uh, uh, Bibi Doshi uh, did a similar kind of a project in Aranya housing in Indore or uh, Charles Korea in Navi Mumbai, um, such kind of a projects are there. Yes, there are number of a good projects are also happening in this part of the world also. I mean, no denial of the fact, but uh, talking about Aravena work, of course, I mean, it's one of the path breaking work. I mean, here I would, as an academician, I would really, because uh, Aravena is a good friend, so that's why I, I can speak about some of uh, the initiative, what he has been a unique in the sense that is elemental, which is a student body. I mean, it's a, I mean, it, it is a, a research body of university, marriage with, with the professional body, and now that they, they create the work. So such kind of a practices are not very common in India. Yes, there are bit and parcel, there are few things happening, but such kind of initiative where, I mean, the role of an organization like UIA or uh, Indian Institute of Architect or Council of Architecture can also take an important role. We need to engage young generation also, because whenever we are talking about UIA or IIA and all, yes, I mean, we can say that 90% of the people who are visiting in UIA, they are, a, if, if not senior architect, but they are architects, but very, very less uh, participation by younger architects or students. I am sure that it's not even 10% also. So we should try to engage younger generation, even young architects, students, because they are going to be the future architects. So I believe in that way, the Aravera was a very, very experimental and it clicked. So we should also see some kind of experiment in India also. So that's my closing comment. I, uh, I leave to uh, Vartika now. Yes, um, thank you, Architect Rajendra. So I would, uh, because we are about to close now, I would like to have one, one a sentence messages as a closing note 
uh, for the architecture fraternity, messages for the architecture fraternity in this time of crisis that is going on, you know, the, for the also that they see, look at the opportunities of the moment. So one sentence or two sentence closing note from each one of you. Pratika. Yes. I would say to all the architects, any pandemic crisis or not, do your best all the time and try to convince and take the political forces with you to help build as best as you can, design as best as you can, and make your mark at the society and say so that the society can say that the architects are wanted. It shouldn't be that the architects are looking for projects. It should be society should be looking for the architects. With that, I would like to close. And also, since the closing, I would like to thank Thomas for being here at this conference. And Thomas, please give my regards to your wife. We still remember both of you. And hopefully, we'll meet in Brazil physically. And of course, before that, in any of the other video conferences. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you so much for this wonderful closing. Uh, may I now ask uh, architect Vijay Garg to please share? Yeah. Th 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 thank you, Vartika. Uh, I'm well, sure. Uh, and to uh, President Thomas Mr. for being Thomas. here. And I would like to say a little a step ahead what Mr. Balbir Varma, he's been an exemplary leader in terms of architects in India. And, and I think in the recent time after J.R. Bhalla, Balbir Verma is the only person who is remembered for his leadership to the profession and connecting people to UIA. And uh, what I say that we need, need, need to provide leadership to people. And now we should take to come into the governance and become a political force. And that is what is required because what our ideas, what we want to make human habitat better sustainable we are having all such ideas which a development required before on which the political people win elections so why can't we become a political force and who can lead the world from the front rather than only just saying that we will be politically strong and we should be taking country politically ahead and we should be the leaders for tomorrow thank what you the that not an architect the should take the lead in their cities to become mayors, parliamentarians, and lead the country yes. from front. Yes. That is my message to you. Yes. Thank you so much for such a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful message. Now, last but not least, <laughs> I'm moving to um, architect Thomas Bonier, though he has shared a lot of things, but one, one, one closing note. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, remember why you became an architect. Remember what it is that attracted you to this profession and what was in your heart when you said to yourself, I want to be an architect. And wow. if you remember what drew you to the profession, what originally motivated you to become an architect, I think that is the most powerful force you can muster and you can bring to your work and to society. Um, we, through life, become involved in many complicated and difficult things. It's the nature of life. But if we remember the simple beauty of what attracted us to our profession, I think it makes us strong and uh, will carry us a great distance. Again, I send my thanks to all of you for this opportunity to, to be with you. And uh, I wish you well and look forward to seeing you in the world. Thank you so much. What could be more wonderful than such beautiful, beautiful closing notes with so much of, so much of, you know, uh, important messages for the architecture fraternity. So with this, with this beautiful notes, uh, we are closing for today and definitely we're going to meet you again with another important guest, another important personality from the world of architecture, soon in the Offices Reporter. Thank you so much. And see you in Brazil. See you in Brazil. <laughs> see you in Brazil.